Questions 26 through 29. Listen to part of a discussion in a history class. After the Wright brothers made their first flight in 1903, numerous people began experimenting with powered flight. As a result, there were swift improvements in airplanes. Basically, airplanes became faster, safer, and larger. However, it wasn't until 1947 that one crucial milestone in the history of flight was achieved. It took place on October 14, 1947. On that day, Chuck Yeager, who was a captain in the United States Air Force, piloted an experimental aircraft called the Bell X-1. His plane was powered by a special type of rocket fuel. Anyway, Yeager and his plane were airlifted high into the atmosphere by a B-29 Super Fortress. Uh, that was an enormous bomber, which was first manufactured during World War II. Well, the B-29 dropped the X-1. Yeager fired up the engines, and the plane quickly sped away. Soon afterward, Yeager reached a speed of Mach 1.06, and people on the ground heard the first man-made sonic boom. That's right. Chuck Yeager had just broken the sound barrier. Now, uh, I made that feat sound really simple, but it wasn't. It took, uh, well, a tremendous amount of effort to break the sound barrier. In fact, people weren't even sure that it was possible. There were many scientists who believed it would act as a sort of physical barrier and therefore couldn't be exceeded. Obviously, um, they were wrong about that and lots of other things, but that's why people do experiments, to determine if something is possible or not. Anyway, as soon as people realized it was possible to break the sound barrier, many different things happened. Obviously, one of them was that military aircraft became much faster. Today, a lot of them regularly exceed the speed of sound. Some can go two, three, or even four times faster than the speed of sound. In addition, civilian aircraft that could break the sound barrier were constructed. The first of these to be used as a passenger plane was the Tupolev Tu-144. It was a Soviet aircraft that flew for the first time in 1968. A few years later, in 1976, the French and British built the Concorde. It was a supersonic passenger plane that made regular flights from London and Paris to New York. Now answer the questions. Number 26. What is the main topic of the talk? Number 27. Why does the teacher mention the Bell X-1? Number 28. What does the teacher suggest about the sound barrier? Number 29. According to the teacher, what was the first passenger airplane to break the speed of sound? Questions 30 through 34. Listen to a teacher talking in a biology class. Check out the pictures on page 31 of your textbooks, please. As you can see, there are three pictures. One is of some flowers, another is of some trees, and the third is of some bushes. Flowers, trees, and bushes are all plants. Just by looking at them, it's obvious that they have many differences. For instance, um, they differ in size, appearance, and color. Yet all of these plants have similar parts. The three main parts of plants are... Anyone? I know. They are roots, stems, and leaves. Correct. Of course, plants have more than three parts, but roots, stems, and leaves are their three primary parts. The roots are found at the bottoms of plants. They enter the ground and help anchor plants to the soil. As a result, this prevents plants from being blown away by the wind or getting swept away by flooding water. What else do roots do? 
They absorb water and various nutrients from the ground. Well done, Tommy. I'm glad you all seem to be on the ball today. Roots can take in both water and nutrients from the soil. Then they transport them above ground to the other parts of the plants. Oh, and one more thing about roots before we continue. You should be aware that the root systems of plants vary. Some are quite small. For instance, you can easily pull many flowers out of the ground by their roots. Others, especially trees, have extensive root systems. Some, such as pine trees, have something called a taproot. This is a root that grows straight down, often quite deeply, and makes a plant very hard to uproot. Many plants have root systems that spread widely. This is particularly common with desert plants. The roots of desert plants can extend very far in all directions in order to absorb as much water as possible in their dry environments. Next up is the stem. The stem extends from the roots above the ground. It is typically long and slender. It is quite strong since it needs to support the rest of the plant. The plant's leaves branch off from it. So,、uh, what exactly does the stem do? Anyone? No. Okay. Let me tell you then. Now answer the questions. Number thirty. What is the subject of the talk? Number thirty one. What does the teacher say about roots? Number thirty two. According to the teacher, which plants have tap roots? Number thirty three. Why does the teacher talk about desert plants? Number thirty four. What will the teacher probably do next? Questions thirty five through thirty eight. Listen to part of a discussion in a social studies class. Okay, so those are roughly the time periods when modern humans came to occupy the Earth's continents. As I just mentioned, Africa was where we believe modern humans, uh, Homo sapiens, evolved. This happened around one hundred fifty thousand years ago. I also stated that the first modern humans. Are believed to have left Africa sometime around seventy thousand years ago. <clears throat> Now let me get this discussion started by asking a simple question: Why do you think modern humans left Africa? Who wants to go first? I'll try, Mrs. McKinney. Well, I know the first humans were hunter-gatherers, so most of them followed herds of animals around and hunted them. I suppose it's possible that some of those herds migrated out of Africa, and headed into the Middle East and other lands. But the Middle East is mostly a desert environment. Why would large herds of animals wander into the desert? There wouldn't be any food or water for them. That doesn't make any sense to me. Not necessarily, Shannon. Think about it like this. Is the climate in this region the same as it was, say, fifty years ago? Fifty years ago, wasn't there some huge drought then that lasted a few years? There's definitely no drought here these days. It rains all the time. Oh, I see your point. Exactly, climates change. Much of the Middle East is desert now, but it wasn't always the case. 
Seventy thousand years ago, it's possible that the Middle East was as green and fertile as this area here. Hey, maybe that's another reason that the first humans left Africa: climate. Perhaps a drought in some part of Africa forced them to leave the continent, and I suppose that war could be another reason. That's right. Humans lived in small tribes then. It's entirely possible that defeated tribes left Africa in search of a new homeland. The winners would have stayed, while the losers might have had no choice but to depart. Okay, I've heard three good reasons, but I want more. What other possible reasons could there have been for a mass migration? Now answer the questions. Number thirty-five. What is the main topic of the discussion? Number thirty-six. Why does the girl suggest that the Middle East is a desert environment? Number thirty-seven. What does the teacher imply about the Middle East? Number thirty-eight. What does the teacher say about wars in Africa? Questions thirty-nine through forty-two. Listen to a teacher talking in an English literature class. We can divide English literature into several periods. The earliest is known as Old English. This refers to works of literature that were written prior to hmm, around 1100 or so. Old English, by the way, is extremely different from modern English. In fact, if you read some Old English poetry, there is virtually no way you'd understand more than a handful of words. The most well-known work of literature from that period is Beowulf. I'm sure all of you have at least heard of it. It's an epic poem that tells the tale of the hero Beowulf and his battles against various monsters. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to study any old English literature this year. You'll have to wait until next year to do that. But we are going to study some works from the next period in English literature. The second period is known as Middle English. During that time, the English language was undergoing a lot of changes. It started to look more like modern English. However, Middle English is still hard to decipher. Uh, don't worry. By the way, we're not going to read anything in Middle English. We're going to read versions that have been rendered into modern English. Anyway, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer was one of the most notable writers during this period. Uh, it lasted from around 1100 to 1500. After that, the next period is Renaissance literature, but we won't cover it for a while. So, uh, back to Middle English. As I was saying, Geoffrey Chaucer was a famous Middle English poet. He wrote the Canterbury Tales. There were also many works by anonymous authors during that time. Pearl is one. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is another. Oh, and I think this is something that will interest you. A lot of literature written in this period features King Arthur and his knights. For example, in the late 1400s, Sir Thomas Malory published a famous work on King Arthur. It was called Le Mort de Arthur. That's French for the death of Arthur. We're going to read some excerpts from it. In fact, we're going to read several poems about King Arthur. I love these works, and I'm sure you'll enjoy them as well. Now answer the questions. Number thirty-nine. Why does the teacher mention Beowulf? Number forty. What does the teacher suggest about Middle English?
Number 41. What did Geoffrey Chaucer write? Number 42. What is probably true about the teacher? Stop. This is the end of the listening section.